Well, good morning. Oh, you guys look great. Thank you for being here. Listen, I don't know if you noticed anything different, but you walk through uh, kind of this space area in the front. Yeah, I don't know if you caught that. So welcome to Space Point Christian Church. Uh, yeah, we changed the name. So this is the aftermath of DDD, but we wanted to, uh, and I'll share a little bit about that, but we first want to just welcome you. Uh, thank you for bringing the church into the building. And thank you for those of you who are online for being the church wherever you are. Uh, first of all, we wanted to just say welcome to all the guests. We have a connect card that you can locate in the, in the uh, back seat there that we would love if this is your first time. We'd just love to get your information. Not that so we can bombard you with things so that you're in the know. If you want to know things, you can just fill that out and we'll be able to send you some information. For those of you who are online, uh, if you wouldn't mind sharing the feed and subscribing to the YouTube channel, that way you know when we're back on uh, live and you can share it with others. And then we have, we don't have a physical bulletin at LightPoint. We have a digital bulletin. So there's a QR code on the back of the seats and you can use your phone and uh, you can scan that. Now, if you're a regular, you already know that that's through the Church Center app. So you can just open the Church Center app and see all the information and what's happening uh, this week because we're back on because DDD is over. So yeah, let me share with you some things about um, the daddy-daughter dance this year. Uh, first of all, and there's going to be some photos uh, thrown across there. First of all, last year we had 58 dads. This year we had 75 dads. Last year we had 88 daughters. And this year we had 116 daughters. So we had 191 total this year, um, and last year we did one night only, and this year we had to go to two nights. So it was packed both nights. We sold out of each one of those. 73% of those that attend our daddy-daughter dance do not attend our church. Uh, so it's a, it's a beautiful way to, to do an outreach. We had over 60 volunteers that put in a range from four hours to 80 hours worth of work during that week. Uh, we had eight out-of-this-world planets created. You can see some of those planets back there. 25 dozen cupcakes, 520 francs in a blanket, 800 chicken nuggets, and over 10,000 pieces of confetti thrown on the floors in this room. Thanks to Brian Fackler, that's all vacuumed up. Um, I, I, some of the stories were, I loved the, the, a couple of them were, there were a lot of, it was sad, but there were a lot of crying girls as they left. Um, and yeah, they were just like, I don't want to go. Daddy, don't make me go. So the dads were like, I'm sorry. We can come back next year. So there was a lot of crying. They just loved being here. We always love when, when we see the daughters' faces as they come in, just looking around uh, the whole place. So uh, obviously you, you can see a little bit of glow here, but the entire room glows there was a UFO. You probably see that picture up here. Uh, Pastor Phil was in the middle of it, uh, DJing uh, this this weekend. So it was it was a fun uh, fun opportunity. We also had uh, we also did something special with. We talked about stars, and we gave uh, we we gave the dad star bracelets to give it to their daughters, and then they they recite a little uh, um, uh, promise poem t uh, to the daughters as they stood there. So one of the moms said, "I got an email that night." said, my daughter was super excited. She was telling me all the things. Daddy gave her a bracelet and he promised me this. And then the daughter looked down and realized there was no bracelet on. She had lost it. And tears happened there as well. So it was really cute. We were able to get them their bracelet back. Uh, so she's safe and ready to go with her star bracelet. And it's just a beautiful opportunity uh, that we have in the community. And we also know we've made it simply because we, we had on Facebook... Uh, people attempt to uh, scam us. Yeah, they were like, hey, I bought five tickets I need to sell. We're like, you're not registered. So they were trying to scam us. So you know you've made it when you've got scammers on your uh, Facebook trying to scam you. So beware, Facebook people. Uh, but would you stand this morning as we begin to worship? Uh, our great friend Nate, who's usually on the drums, is going to be leading worship this morning. Leah's out sick. And so we're thankful for servants like Nate. Nate, take us to worship. I'm going to need your a lot of help up here, okay? So put your hands together where appropriate. We 
we worship. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We sing. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung upon that cross. He rose up from the grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars, and we were the beggars. And now we're royalty. We are the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There is joy. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. Sing worthy with me. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever breathe. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Sing holy. And holy, there is no one like
sing worthy. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. We live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and leave me in your love to those around me. And holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. I will build, and I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation, and I will put my trust in you. Lord, 
Life Point, and I'm Bobby Johnson. I'm a partner along with you in the service of our King, Jesus. And we've come to a special time in this, in this week. We've come to Sunday, the Lord's Day, where we get to gather together from all the different walks of life that we have to worship the one true King, the one true God, the only way to heaven, Jesus of Nazareth. This is a part of our service where we practice communion. It's our, it's our practice, it's our tradition. And I'd like to share a little bit about what that is this morning from Romans chapter 5, starting verse 8. It says, but God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if, we, for if, for if while we were, excuse me, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall be saved by his life. We are reconciled to God because of his death on the cross. We are considered enemies of God unless we have been reconciled to God. It's only through the blood of Jesus Christ. And every time we take that 
take that communion cup. Every time we take that communion bread, we need to remember the cost that it costs us, the cost that it costs him to rescue us, to reconcile us so that we may be the friends of God. If you're watching online, we'd like you to enjoy to join us with us and practice in our communion service this week. When we gather our elements, you come through the outer aisles, go to the front or to the back, returning through the center, remembering the cost that it costs Christ to reconcile us, that we may be able to sing what a friend we have in Jesus. And we may be able to sing the paid, the price that he paid. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much now for this opportunity to worship you this week, to come together as a family of believers. Lord, this has been a hard week for some and an easy week for others, but you've been in each and everyone's hearts and everyone's lives this week. We pray that we remember the death of your son, Jesus Christ, on the cross, that, the, that you have reconciled us, that we may be friends with God. Bless this bread. Let us remember that sacrifice. Bless the cup that we may remember the covenant. And in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may rise and come to the outer aisles and to the, to gather the elements. Bread represents symbolic of the body of Christ, of his sacrifice given for us that we may be reconciled to God. Take and eat. This cup represents the blood of Jesus Christ shed on our behalf that we may become part of the people of God. The apostle Paul says we proclaim these things until he comes. I get to stay up here a little bit longer. I get great pleasure out of serving my Lord. And I get to participate with you every week in some shape, form, or fashion, either singing or listening to the word. But one of the things that I love doing is giving my, what God has given to me, a portion back to him. And this is the part of the time where we give back to God. We give an offering from the abundance God has given to us. Now we here at LifePoint, we ask you to give out of whatever God's laid on your hearts. No guilt trips, no pressure. Whatever God's laid on your heart to give back to God, do that this week. There's three ways to give. There's giving through the black box in the back. If you want to give on, the, on your way out the door, you can do that. You can give on the website. One suggestion is if you're going to give on the internet, make sure you get the right life point. There's a lot of life points out there. Make sure you get the right one. Trust me, I go look for the, for the weekly message or something like that, and I get all kinds of life points. So make sure you get the right life point. Or you can give by texting. 84321, right? 84321, am I reading that right, guys? Yeah. All right, fantastic. That's another way you guys can do that, too. 
So whatever God's laid on your heart this week, I've heard it said this, there is no true, sac- there is no true worship without sacrifice. Give back to the Lord as he has blessed you this week. Let us pray. Father God, there's many things that go on in our lives, but we want to take this moment to give back to you just a small portion of what you've given to us out of reverence and out of thanksgiving for you. Thank you so much for your blessings and bless us this day as we, as we worship you through the music, we worship you through the giving, we worship you through communion, and now we're about to worship with you through word. We pray that our lives be changed, that you may receive glory and honor. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. And it's not me, that's for sure. That's for sure. Um, uh, so, uh, I know, you need to say that. Um, we have a guest speaker this morning. Pastor Phil is out of town at a wedding. Uh, Ali was out. So we just have, we've got all kinds of wonderful people filling in this morning. So this morning, uh, you've seen him here before, Carl Kreisman. He's a history professor, an author. He served in ministry in many roles since 1985. And he has more degrees than Fahrenheit. So would you welcome Carl Kreisman? Come on up. Thank you, Bill. Pray with me. We can't go too often to the Lord. Father God, we love you so much. We praise you. We come now to open your word. You've been present through this time. You were present before we walked in. This is holy ground consecrated for you. We know you're present with us individually, but you're also present in your sanctuary. God, I pray that you would open our ears to hear. You'd open our hearts to receive. Father, for myself, that you'd place me behind the cross. You know, we haven't come, Father, to hear the words of a human, but instead we have come to receive your bread of life, which is the sustaining Bread, man does not live by human bread, but by the word of God, and we come to you for that. I love you, Father, and praise you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, it is a great joy to be back here with you guys at, what was it called, Matt? It's, what's the church called? The Space, space Point, right? Space Point. I walked in, and I thought, maybe I prepared the, the wrong message. We are in a series on James, so hopefully you've been paying attention and listen to Pastor Phil as you be kind of working your way through. I have, um, was listening to various of the sermons. And, you know, Matt said, hey, will you come back? And I'm like, oh, I love being asked to come back. That's always a good thing. I didn't, I didn't, you know, bore people too much the first time when I was here. I really liked that. And I had some ideas, uh, you know, some sweet things to talk about, some, some good things that God's showing me. And Matt's like, no, no, no. Uh, would you please look at Matt, James 4. So, you know, James 4, what is causing quarrels and fights among you? I'm like, Matt, what are you trying to tell me about your church? What, 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 should, what should I know? So James, as you know, is the brother of Jesus. He's writing this to believers who have left Jerusalem. Phil said last week, Jewish Christians who have dispersed from the area around Jerusalem in the years after the events of Christ. It's written somewhere about a decade after the whole crucifixion, resurrection thing goes down. Um, We know from the first Corinthians creed, the earliest evidence of the faith of Jesus, three years, um, that Jesus appeared to James directly. 
That's always one of those moments in the Bible, I'm like, ooh, I'd love to be there for that. Would love to have been for that conversation. But that's kept private, right? That's between Jesus and his brother, and they have a conversation. And at that moment, James goes from being a doubter and somebody who thought Jesus was maybe crazy um, to a believer. And in that decade, as Peter and the other apostles move on out, James becomes the centerpiece of the church in Jerusalem. So we know from the very beginning, Peter's first sermon, 3,000 got saved, and then people were added to their number daily, we're told, as they continued to speak about the Lord. And those people who were there at that moment for what we call Pentecost, obviously dispersed. And so now some of them had been living there, and so James wants to write to them. So he's writing, as I know you've been paying attention and listening over the weeks, a very practical guide of how to live. Some theologians like to sometimes pit James against Paul. I think that's a poor reading of both James and Paul. And if you read both, you'll see them giving the one consistent message of what it means to live as a Christian and to walk in the world. So that's important though, because when you read chapter four, you're like, whoa, is he talking to a specific church? He's not. So James is not writing to a church. So what Paul writes, he'll say to the church at Corinth or to the church at Ephesus, right? So he's talking to a specific church. We can get something out of it. We can see like what's going on in that church. And from that, we're able to extrapolate to our own lives. James is not. James is saying, hey, you Christians. Now that's really important when you get to this because there are other points. Paul does this a couple of times where he names people out. Wouldn't that be terrible if you were named in a document? If 150 years from now or 500 years from now, there's some documents about life point and your name's in it. And it's like, these two people were always causing us trouble. <laughs> be careful. Cause I know Matt takes notes. So, you know, he does, James isn't doing that. So when you read James four, You have to read this as a message to yourself, not to some troublemakers who are causing problems. Does that make sense? This is really important because we're gonna go, this really is one of the hard messages. I texted Matt back and forth going, are you sure you want me to do this one? Because this might be something Phil needs to cover. But we're gonna go into it and see what is James trying to tell us? And it links to, in my opinion, one of the core themes of kind of the question of who we're trying to be. So, so let me just kind of walk you through here. And I'm actually going to, before we get any screens on the board, I want you to link it back to where Phil was last week. Do you remember what the last verse you read last week? So if you've got your Bible, you can look at it. It's not going to be on the screen. Um, but if you start in chapter three, in verse 18, those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. Verse four, one, what is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Remember chapter verses and chapters, that's all made up. Remember when you read these, first of all, remember the Bible is not a single book. The Bible is a repository of 66 ancient documents. And when it's written, particularly here, you can almost imagine these passages here when you read Paul's letters or James, it's like somebody gave you an email and said, I'm gonna send this to this other group. All right, so just read it as a consistent, long, flowing email, right? You're getting some insider information here. So when we have chapter divides and verses, that was added later. So you can see James is writing in the passage that Phil went through last week. James is flowing into this and the Spirit's guiding him. And he's going, you know, we need to talk about wisdom. And then he's talking about how this rolls into being a peacemaker. Being a peacemaker is one of the key things. If you were here last time I was here, we talked about the clothing that you wear before you put on the armor of God. The armor of God, Ephesians 6. The clothing that you wear, Colossians 3. And in that, there's a statement two different times where Paul is saying, hey, you need to be a peacemaker. If you've read, and I'm certain you have, the Sermon on the Mount, this idea of Jesus, what he's saying when he's suggesting, I want to create a new type of human. I want us to go back to the garden and be, in essence, the humans as first created. And I'm here to do that with you. And he's laying that out, that kind of unique, we might say weird, certainly non-normal way of living. Please understand, church, When you choose to become a Christian, you're signing up for the abnormal way of life, all right? And so he's saying, look, you'll be somebody who goes into situations and makes peace. It's one of the first beatitudes. 
right? So James is linking that in here. He's saying, hey, be a peacemaker. And then what's the very next phrase? Well, what's causing the quarrels and fights among you, right? So this kind of gets us into this place where I want us to look at these first four verses. And I want you to be thinking in terms of throughout the whole passage, what are your passions? You know, what is where your delight is? Because this is, I think, a core theme of what God is saying to anyone who wants to be his child, who wants to be in his family, who wants to be one of his chosen people. Where are your passions? So now let's, let's kind of read through this. All right? So first one kind of walks us through, James 4, 1 to 3. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly for your own passions, suspend it on your passions. Uh, that, that's, that, that is, James is throwing down right here to get our attention. Now, in the Greek, when you read kind of what he says there about war and fighting in verse one, that the idea where he says wars, think of that as like World War II or the Civil War. And then when he says fights, in the Greek, he's thinking of like a specific battle, right? So the Battle of Midway, the Battle of Antietam, which is a thing within the whole. Does that make sense for everybody? So he's saying, look, you're fighting a war and you're having engagements of conflict in a momentary situation. Midway happened at a specific point. World War II is this kind of setting that we put dates to, but it's kind of a thing. Does that make sense? So he's saying to these Christians, Remember, he's not pointing one person out. You're the person doing the fighting. He's not saying that. He's saying all y'all, Carl included, why are you engaged in a prolonged global conflict and bringing on specific engagements of conflict at this moment in time? Why are you doing that? Which is, well, where are your passions? Look what he says in verse three. I'm sorry, verse two, first. You desire and you don't have. You murder. You covet and you can't have it. You fight, same thing he says in verse one. You war. And then in verse three, it's kind of, it's, it's really a hard verse. You could have, we're not, a whole sermon about what does it mean for us to pray and talk to God? And then what do we expect from him? That's not what we're doing today. And be careful with this verse in my opinion, to not take it out of its context and kind of make it something about what's the formula to get God to do what I want him to do. And you really have to do a whole sermon series on what does it mean to pray and talk to God. But there is something in here about praying because he's saying, look in verse three, even when you ask, you don't get it. And the why is because you're asking for only the thing that brings you pleasure. Right now, and, and I know, as someone who prays a lot, and I think to myself, I'm asking for stuff that God should want. And I'm talking about salvations, healings, um, movement of His Spirit. I still have to be aware that I'm finite, and as the finite human, my requesting could still be for my own pleasure at some level. I don't even think I can explain it further than that. But just understand, James is trying to clarify to you and me what drives you. Right? What, what is your passion? What is central to your being? The psalmist gets us here. So we're gonna go back and forth to Psalm 1. So go ahead and flip in your Bibles to Psalm 1 as well. Hang on to James. We're going to come back to it. Psalm 1 for me, well, it always has been a kind of a, 
a big deal. But Psalm 1 for me has over the past, say, decade become even more central in like how I perceive to understand what does God want, right? I mean, when I was a young person growing up in the church, I mean, I'm really blessed. My, my parents, well, my, I'm a fourth generation pastor. Um, and I've been ordained for 30 years as a minister and I've got a legacy of faith going back. And my mom and dad raised us in the admonition of the Lord, in the reading of the word, both at our house and in church. We were one of those proverbial families that back in the day, we're talking 50, 60 years ago, you know, you're at church all the time. It's the only place you went was the church. And that aspect of God's word would lead me to say as a young person, well, what am I supposed to do? And you would sometimes hear or get the impression from preachers or from church that there was a task to accomplish, which I would say at one level there is. However, Psalm 1 is kind of laying out for us a focus of how to live our lives. So, now there's Psalm 1 to 3, which we're gonna dig into later, but let's zoom into verse 2, right? Just the verse 2. The person who wants to walk with God, his delight is in the law of the Lord. Let me go back to James for you. You're asking all wrong because you're asking about only what will give you pleasure. Where is your pleasure? What is your delight? This, I think, is a massively important question right now for our society, but for the Christians within the society, because there should be something about you if you are truly a believer in which, without you doing any song and dance, people notice. And I mean, I just offer that may be a key part of what they may notice is that your delight is not what everybody else's delight is. Now, this is gonna be hard because for most of us, we immediately go to kind of evil delights. We'll come back to this in a second, but let me just, I'm just warning you now. Again, I'm like, Matt, really? Do I have to do this one? Because James isn't playing around. It's about to get harder here in a second because he's asking you to question and to identify and to sort of um, measure against what you are going to say is my focus, is a word we might better use for ourselves. But what do you delight in? Where do you take pleasure? All right? So now let's go back to the hard part. James chapter four, verse four. You adulterers, wow, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity, there's another concept of word, of war, with God? Our brother just got finished saying it from another passage. In other words, take that passage he just said. The scripture says there, it's in a couple of different places in Paul's letters. Once you were enemies with God, but he loved you and rescued you, not because you deserve it, but you were his enemy, but he rescued you. Now, who's James talking to? We would say, using my phrase, those who God rescued. And yet, life that I'm living may make me someone who is looking in God's eyes like I'm back to being his enemy. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Think how crazy that is. It's almost like Paul from Galatians. Who has bewitched you? At one point, you recognize I was an enemy. Well, maybe I don't admit I was an enemy, but I was minding my own business, and then God revealed himself, and bam, now I'm in his glorious light, and I realize, oh my goodness, I wasn't trying to be, but now I'm his enemy. I was his enemy before he saved me. I wasn't even deserving it. But then now what? What have I done with how I'm living my life? I'm living my life 
where my passions and my energies and my delights are over here where I started. Wow. That is a hard, hard word. Now let's understand this thing about adulterer. So for the beginning of this year, I decided to read the Bible through. It had been a long time since I'd gone Genesis to Revelation and just sort of read the whole Bible through. I mean, I've read it all and I've read it multiple times and I have read it through, but it had been a long time since I said, let's just start in Genesis one and kind of rock my way through. And I'm just telling you, church, God is blowing my mind. I've got a note on my, um, on my phone and my iPad, and I started writing down the things God wrote. I'm seeing something like, that verse has been there all the time? I mean, and it's, so it's a parenthesis, this is just bonus material. Go read your Bible and let yourself read it fresh. I'm a, I'm a teacher, and I tell people the key to learning is wonder. Because we're not always interested in everything. My wife loves science. I don't care. It just bugs me. So I don't care about science. It's just not my thing, right? But if I had to take a science class, I have to allow myself to become curious. And you can allow yourself, if you can get back to childlike wonder, why do you think Jesus says, be like a child, right? Have faith like a child. And so wonder allows me to get into it. So I'm reading and I'm going, my goodness, man, it's... And it's, it's, as, as the scripture should, it's given me a lot of questions for God where I'm going, dude, what's up, man? I, I don't think I understand this. And he and I have some great conversations and I'm slow and he's teaching me, right? In Leviticus, God lays out this reasoning how we're gonna get to adulterer. So look at, it's gonna be on the screen, Leviticus 20, verse 20. So I know nobody says, oh, I wanna hear a sermon about Leviticus. <laughs> that actually was where I was gonna take you guys to a whole sermon about Leviticus. And so see, I just took what Matt gave me and I spun it because I wanted to get Leviticus in here because God's been blowing my mind with Leviticus. I mean, it is some, it is, it, no, I mean in a good way. It's just like some good stuff. I, I encourage you as, as an individual believer, go to Leviticus one and start reading. You really need to start at the end of the Exodus after they get out. And so like Exodus 13 and start reading because if you listen to the Lord, you'll be, wow. So here he is, look, he says, you shall be holy to me for I, the Lord am holy and I have separated you from the peoples why that you should be mine he's like I want you for my very own now we know that's to the God's chosen people or the Jews or the Israelite nation or the descendants of Abraham but of course what Jesus came to do was to open that door as was the original plan Hey, Abraham, I'm gonna bless you so through you all the peoples of the world will be blessed. Everybody's in, right? So it's not a weird new thing. God didn't change his mind. It was the original plan kind of moving us through. So we get to be included in this. So when you read some of the passages in Leviticus, like this one, you should say, oh, wow, God is saying, I'll flip it around for Christians. If you've chosen to believe If you've heard from the Holy Spirit and then been brought into his marvelous light, then God is saying, I've chosen you to be holy. There's not an option of like, well, some people like Phil can be holy, but I want to be sort of, sort of holy. That's not an option. That God doesn't give you that option. And he's saying, look, I have brought you in. Now you you dig through the rest of particularly the Pentateuch, you see this, I'm in Deuteronomy now, and Moses is just hammering on this point. Look, God is setting you apart. And he's reminding them, look what God has done for you. And this is why I love history in general. You need to know your history. If you've not written down your testimony, go home this afternoon and write out your testimony. How in the world did you get here? And I don't mean here, I mean to walk in with Jesus. Write it down. Go back in your mind. How old were you? Who was central? Who, wrote the, who opened the word to you? Write it down. And the reason you write it down is so that you can remember that you did nothing to get this bonus. Amen. Amen. God did this for you. That's, I, mean, I could stop now. We just preach and pray and go home. But that's it. But now this is the point, back to the adulterer. God did this for you. 
And there is then an expectation from him on you and me. It's not a cheap grace. Hey, you're in. Now go have fun. I'm sorry. We, I think we want this, but this is not the testimony of the Bible. It's just not. And so when you look at this, he goes through this again and again in the Old Testament. As you, most of you know, once we get past the writings of the poets, we run into the long chapters of the prophets. Now, Matt will make fun of me for this, but I am actually getting another degree. <laughs> and I know, I'm too old, it's kinda silly, but God said do it, I'm like, all right. And as a part of this, what I did is I read through the entire prophets and I made notes about what did they say God was frustrated or upset about to the point that why he would punish his people. And when you go through that list, the number one complaint that God has about his people is idolatry. By far. There's about six things. There's only about six things. And they're probably not things you would think of. There's a little bit of a surprise when I went read through. And I went through every one of them. But the number one, by far, idolatry. And when you look at places like Hosea or Ezekiel or Amos or Jeremiah, the description that is used for the idolatrous heart is the same as an unfaithful partner in a marriage. And they say specifically, you have committed adultery. Now, just again, who's James writing to? Everybody. And in case you wanna say, well, well, that's not me, Carl. Jesus would say, I beg to differ. Because you've heard it said, if someone goes and sleeps with somebody else, they've committed adultery. But I say to you, if you have thought lustfully in your mind, well, I'm sorry, ain't a person breathing in this room that haven't done that. Wow. Which is again, what they say at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Have we ever heard anybody teach like this? And the answer is no. So he's bringing stuff we don't wanna hear. He's kind of throwing down on us in this way. He goes on, Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount. So go to Matthew 6 if you want to. Matthew 6, 21. Where your heart is is where you've stored up treasures. He's talking about how to live in a way, of course, that, that kind of connects to he is the provider and you're not supposed to worry and there's the lilies of the field and the trees and the birds and stuff. But in the end, he's saying, well, wh where's your passion? Wherever your heart is, wherever your passions are, that's your heart. If I've saved you to be here with me as the holy, one, holy relationship, but you let your heart go over here, you adulterers. I mean, that's harsh. I don't like hearing it. I like to think I'm doing pretty good. Remember, this isn't James writing to you, but not Carl. He's writing it to me. James is like, if just James, me and James are the last people on the planet to be like, Carl, you know, you ask for stuff, but your, your, your motives are wrong. Why are you arguing with people? Why, why are you fighting with people? Why are you so frustrated? You know, you want stuff, you're not getting it, so you take it out on other people. You're upset about things all the time. Why, why? I tell you why, you're an adulterer. <sighs> wow. I, I, mean, I told you, it's, it's hard. It's hard. Remember, if you, again, if you go back to the Pentateuch, Paul says the same thing in Corinthians. You were not chosen because you were special. Repeatedly, God says to, in the Old Testament to those people, you were not chosen because you were a large group or you were powerful, or you had wealth. You were the smallest. Yeah. You were insignificant. Yeah. And more specifically, at the point of Moses, you were slaves. Yeah. Every one of you were a slave. Well, think about us. What are we told in the New Testament? I was a slave uh -huh. to sin. Every one of us were slaves. There's nobody in the room who wasn't a slave. And we were rescued and brought into this relationship. And then all God wants is you to be faithful to that. And I know in this room, you all came to church after the daddy-daughter dance. You all came and you spent time here. 
So you could say, but Carl, I'm one of the faithful. I get it. Me too. I would just suggest we should be careful about how bold we make that proclamation until we let the Holy Spirit work on us and answer this question. Where is my delight? That's, that's, that's tough. I understand it. I understand it's tough. Well, let's read four, five, and six together. I, I, I hope you can see why God is so in. God is not distant and in essence sort of bored with who you are. Like, you're not insignificant. He's not just going, well, I don't really care what John does because I got a thousand other faithful worshipers. Remember, he leaves the 99 for the one. He knows each one of you by name. In fact, this is the scary part. He already knows the answer to that question in your heart. The question is, will you admit it and then say, oh, woe is me. And again, I'll repeat it again because I don't want to get lost. James is writing to Christians. You know, one of the problems in our world today is that the church thinks the problem is the world. I said this to you last time. And we want to say, look at all the sins that people are doing. They're doing abnormal things. They're doing hateful things. How dare they? And some Christians get so worked up that they want to do something that God says not to do, which is sort of take over a society and create some kind of like a Christian theocracy. And God's like, no, I got a kingdom on my own. I don't need your help for that. And we say, well, those people need to live better. And Paul reminds us, they're sinners. They don't know the Lord. What do you expect? That's not the problem. The problem is you and me, you adulterer. Where is your delight? Four, five, and six, let's go. You adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity, is war with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes him or herself an enemy of God. Let's keep going. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose, as the scripture says, he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God is a jealous God. Exodus 20, verse five. I am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for other gods. Deuteronomy 4.24, told you I've been in the, in the Pentateuch. I'm just all in this now. The Lord your God is a devouring, consuming fire. He is a jealous God. When it says jealous, look at the word there. For, it's really in Hebrew, zeal or passion. Right? So, so God would say, where's your passion? He would say, it's for you. My passion's for you. I mean, I gave my son. That's how deep my passion is for you. Where's your passion? All right. When your passions, the things you delight for, are something other than God, it makes you an enemy of God. Now you can swear up and down to the person in the mirror. You don't gotta tell me nothing. You don't gotta tell Phil nothing. We're not gonna be on any thrones anywhere. Matt's not making a decision about whether you get to heaven or not. You gotta talk to that person in the mirror. And you can tell that person in the mirror all the lies you want, that I'm not God's enemy. You can say, oh, I, I take the Lord's Supper. I give some money. I was the person who Matt meant when he said he volunteered 80 hours. And God says, Get out of here with that false worship. Get out of here with that noise. Your songs are noise in my ear. I'm not listening because your passions are not where I need them to be. I set you apart as a holy nation, a holy individual. Peter repeats this. We are a holy nation, a kingdom of priests. Does the world, do your neighbors know you're a priest? Can they see it? in our lives. Well, do we have any solution? Are we just trapped? Well, we do. Let's keep reading right there. At the next verse, you see that he quotes it. He says, look, 
God opposes the proud and gives favor to the humble. He opposes the proud and gives favor to the humble. Humble and submit. What are we submitting to? We're submitting to letting God transform us. Now wait, now make sure you hear me say this. I'm not saying, I'll say it for myself and then you can extrapolate. God is not expecting me to be perfect today. He knows I'm going to trip and fall. He knows my heart will wander. Why else do you think Jesus told us, when you pray, pray like this, and it's sort of a pray every day like this, and included in that prayer of all these things we should be saying is what? Father, forgive me. Holy Spirit, test and try me. See if there's any wicked way in me. Cleanse me. That's one of the best things I've gotten out of Leviticus. Sometimes as a New Testament Christian, we look back at those things and we think, well, that was so silly. And then somehow we've allowed that to become a thing where we can sort of act like we don't need to go ask God for forgiveness. Well, Jesus would beg to differ. Yeah. Yeah. Now, look what he's doing. He's quoting here, <laughs> humble and submit. He's quoting Proverbs 3.34, right? So let's go to Proverbs 3.34. James is quoting that. Toward the scorners, he, God, is scornful, but to the humble, he gives favor. Now, this loops us back to Psalm 1. That verse there, when you could see it says, the person who's scornful, in Hebrew, you could say it as, Lord mocks the mockers, or he's scornful to arrogant scoffers, right? So look at verse one, right? Blessed is the person who doesn't do what? Walk in the counsel of the wicked, stand in the way of the sinners, or what? Sit in the seat of, same Hebrew word. Same Hebrew word. Now there's a whole sermon here and we don't have time for it, so I'm not gonna go into it, but what you can take from this is that this is, a pathway for our lives. Now again, if you say, wait, Carl, I don't think I get it. I don't know how to do it. Romans 12, one and two. Present your body as what? A sacrifice. Back to Leviticus. What happens in a sacrifice? Well, it dies. Yeah. And Jesus said, you wanna come after me? Take up your cross. Well, why do people have crosses? They're gonna get hung on them and they're going to die. Yeah. Paul says, you need to die to your fleshly self so that you can live. Yeah. Why do we do baptism? Y'all do baptism, right? Yeah. Why do we do baptism? <laughs> Buried with Christ, raised to walk with newness yeah. of life. Yeah. Yeah. Buried to Christ, you're dead. Yeah. Just leave me down here. <laughs> I'm dead. But then God, through the person, through the person, Baptism. No, no, no. Raised. Who am I? I'm not the dead guy. I shouldn't be the dead guy. I shouldn't want to pursue the dead guy's old passions. Right? right. right? And then what? Don't be conformed, Romans 12, 2. Don't be conformed. Don't let the world press you into its mold. Yeah. But be what? Be transformed by something I do? No. By the renewing of my mind. How? By God. Humble myself every day, every day. You could add a prayer as you're going. Hey God, I humble myself so that you can continue to transform my mind. I am, I am so positive that the Lord who began this good work in you will complete it. But I'm also positive that God has bound himself by one immutable rule. He will not break your free will. So if you say, I know you did this for me, but I'm going this way, he will try to hunt you down like the hound of heaven, and he will try to reach after you as the one that's lost. But in the end, if you say, get off me, he'll be like, okay. Yeah. So if I want to have that transforming spirit, if I want my mind to be changed, what do I have to do? I have to say to God, hey, I need you today. Yeah. Amen. Transform my mind, because the world is very strong. It's very alluring. Yeah. I'm on places like YouTube and Facebook also, and the algorithm will show me things that I don't need to see. Yeah. Yeah. 
And I have to make a choice in that moment. Will I click the link or go on? God, I need you to protect me from myself. Wow. That, that, man, that is. But so this is saying, you can make this choice. And I want you to notice, I'm gonna have time for it. But if you get into the Hebrew, this is describing a person going deeper and deeper and deeper into the way of the world until they become seated. They become rooted. This becomes their way. But then verse two, right? Verse two says, if we, that's not the, the first one, that's what the wrong does. Verse two, it says, but the person will, their delight is in the law of the Lord. And then what? On the law, I meditate. In Hebrew, the word meditate is, and this is country, so some of you may not understand, but when you see some animals, like a cow most famously, but there's other animals like this, they will chew their food repeatedly. It's called chewing their cud. Again, it's too country for you city folk, but <laughs> chewing their cud. And the Hebrew word is describing an animal calmly, happily, stoically, standing still and just chewing and chewing and chewing. So the image here is, are you chewing on the word? Do you, maybe you go, well, I read the Bible every day. I, I got an app. It shows me a verse. 30 minutes later, do you know the verse? Or have you just flipped on by? You checked your box. That's not this person who's meditating on the word. Why? Verse three, right? So that he or she becomes like a tree planted by streams of water, rooted. Where are you rooted? Are you rooted with the scoffers that James says God opposes? Or are you rooted like a tree by a stream that sustains and that fulfills and provides for you? So church, again, where are your passions? Are we left with no solution? No, James, James loves us. God loves us. And he gives us things. Matt's gonna come up here and play. Not Matt, but gonna we'll get some music coming up here. Nate's gonna come up and play. What does James tell us? James says in closing, look, you need to resist the enemy. If you want to follow along in your Bible, you can. You need to draw near to God. Listen prayerfully. They hear this as a prayer. You need to clean your hands. You need to purify your mind. You need to reflect in sadness as you realize how this sinful mindset has distanced you from God. Hey, Carl, I pray, I don't hear God. Maybe because you've walked away. Maybe because you've gotten distant from him. He goes on and says, humble yourself. He says it again, humble yourself. Don't slander, don't defame, don't speak evil about someone else. Leave judgment in God's hands, verse 12. Where are your passions, LifePoint Church member, person watching online? Where is your delight? It's a conversation you have with you and God. You don't need to have it with me. But as we sing, I want you to hear this, not just the closing song, we're gonna go out. Some of you may need to have one of your first honest conversations with God in a long time. Where is my delight? Where am I focused? Have I let my passions for ESPN, for Amazon, for shopping, for fingernails, for hair, for my children, for success at my job, have I let those things become my delight? 
I'm more worried about my grandkids than I am about following and speaking and spending time with the Lord. Where is my delight? I don't know if y'all do this, but this is like an altar. You can come up here to this altar. Not to talk to anybody. Matt will be here if you want to talk to him up here or back there somewhere. You can find him. But just to seek the Lord. Or you can pray in your chair. Where is your delight? Father God, we love you. This is a heavy message, God. I, I didn't really want to bring it. Because it challenges me about me. Oh God, I, again, I pray that you have placed me behind the cross because I need to be a listener. That question of where is my passion hits me as well. Holy Spirit, do your work in this place. Call us to realign ourselves so that we can be like that person who's a tree deeply rooted because my delight is in your ways. And I think about those ways day and night. Please stand. And as we, we sing this last song, use it as a, a time, an opportunity, as a, as a prayer to the Lord to say, the things of this world, the things that, that get me caught up and, and get me uh, in trouble, and God, those, those things, I don't want them to bother me. I just want to give it to you in prayer this morning. What a friend we have in to bear, what a privilege to carry, everything to God in prayer, oh, what peace we often forfeit, oh, what needless pain we bear. Carl, thank you for 
bringing a heart check for all of us this morning. The ability to, uh, your giftedness that you're going to give to God, I know, but thank you for sharing that so that that we have that, uh, that opportunity to lay it down and to kind of question ourselves where we're at in that heart check. I want to uh, allow you, if you still need, uh, Nate will just kind of strum a little bit uh, to come up. But I want to ask you a question. I want you to answer this. I'm going to ask you a question, and you're going to say in the Lord, where is your delight? Where is your delight? Where's your delight? Now, this morning or this afternoon, let's leave like we're living that way, like it's that has that has, that has changed our heart, which then renews our mind so that our actions and our words are that way outside. Have a great week.